Hello, everyone. So we're going to move into the last section under Unit 3. Uh, so in this section, uh, we are planning to discuss about the uh, temperature, heat, and uh, thermal expansion. And then we're going to discuss a little bit about heat transfer methods, conduction, convection, and radiation. And also in this chapter, we're going to uh, move into the oscillations and waves a uh, little bit, and also sound waves and uh, harmonic uh, waves and uh, also a little bit about the uh, intensity of uh, waves, sounds, quality, and those things a uh, little bit. Uh, again, this will be a little longer chapter, but we're going to uh, do uh, very conceptually uh, three chapters together, actually. Uh, that will be in your textbook, uh, chapter 13, uh, 14, and uh, chapter 16. So let me share the screen, then you guys can see the Blackboard page. And this is the uh, third section of the uh, unit number three. Okay, so let me share the presentation. Okay, so first thing is uh, learning about the difference between solid uh, and Fluids. So we discussed about the fluid in our earlier chapter that is considering of uh, liquid and gas. Uh, solid, we discussed before that about the atomic structure and density and those things. So, but what is the difference between these three uh, phases? So a simple example you can think is the uh, water because water has the state of ice, liquid, and also gas right so but what are the difference between these things so solid we can say it as the uh, material matter uh, that have the arrange of molecules in a periodic pattern uh, with the fixed volume and fixed shape there is a definite shape and definite volume those we call it as the uh, solids right so now if you go to the uh, liquid you can think about the liquid pulling into different shape of the uh, beakers. You're going to see the different shape that is coming from the shape of the beaker. So that means you cannot define the uh, shape or you cannot keep fixed shape, but it's still the volume is the same. So by keeping definite volume, but not definite shape, those we call it as the uh, liquid. And gases, neither of them are there for the gases because gases does not have a definite shape for the uh, volume. These are the three uh, kind of matters that we uh, can discuss together. This depend on how particle, distance between particle, how they will change and what is the particle arrangement and what are the uh, particle energies that will affect to stay on these uh, three states. Okay. So now temperature and thermometers, you know that the temperature is the measure uh, of something, how hot or how cold. So, and um, when heated up something, we know that it will expand, right? So uh, usually a thermometer will be the instrument that we can measure how hot or how cold some object is. Right. So now uh, temperature, uh, we can measure by using thermometers and thermometers. We have different thermometers. Those are antique thermometers uh, we had in earlier age. Okay. But to measure the temperature, that means something should change with temperature. Right. So that's something expanding of something we can uh, make it sensitive to the some values. That's what the temperature is basically, right? So now we have basically two types of thermometers. One is uh, probably uh, you can say a liquid in uh, glass type thermometers, right? That's the thermometer you have it in your home or that's the thermometer that you use in your doctor office to measure the temperature. Those are liquid in glass type thermometers. Now we have... Uh, other thermometer which will be like uh, measuring the temperature in your home or the your heater at home so that has a kind of um, bimetallic stripe that will expand and that will 
uh, get the uh, the sensation of how it how much it will expand and then we need to lower down the temperature come back to the its original length so there is another way that we can measure the temperature right so now temperature we're going to measure by using different uh, units so we already know celsius we have use it celsius fahrenheit those scales right so we should know how to uh, convert these things into one another and we basically have three temperature scales one is fahrenheit other one is centigrade and the third one is the kelvin Kelvin is the research level temperature that we use because uh, Kelvin is the one that we call it as the absolute zero. Absolute zero means Kelvin zero temperature. This is the bottom. I have the Kelvin scale. See that Kelvin? So when Kelvin zero, we call it as the absolute zero. But that is not centigrade zero or that is not Fahrenheit zero. In centigrade, it will be this number in Fahrenheit, it will be this number. So now we already know that the freezing point of water is in centigrade, it is zero degrees, but Fahrenheit, it is 32 Fahrenheit. And boiling temperature in centigrade, 100 degrees, and Fahrenheit, it is 212 Fahrenheit, right? So now these three scales, uh, we will be able to convert back and forth but important thing is going from centigrade to kelvin will be basically very simple because you see that they have exactly same amount of divisions that we can directly convert by adding 273.15 to the centigrade you can get the kelvin what i mean by if i add this number to the same number, then you're going to get the zero, right? If I add 273.15 to 100, I'm going to get 373.15 by adding the amount of 273.15, you can convert centigrade into Kelvin directly. But converting in between centigrade and Fahrenheit, you see that you have the ratio nine and five that you need to do the ratio correctly when you go into the centigrade to Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit into centigrade. Okay. So <clears throat> now let's take a look on uh, the uh, conversions that we have. We don't want all those, those conversions, but Fahrenheit to centigrade may be an important conversion. After you know Celsius to Fahrenheit, you can definitely do this backward calculation. That means you don't want the second equation. We still can use the first equation and solve for the centigrade. Okay. Uh, now, as I mentioned, Celsius to Kelvin, you just add 273.15. That will give you the Kelvin range. Again, the other things are you can uh, do it without the formula by thinking the concept. Okay. But these two are the most important uh, conversions. And uh, the temperature scales, as you know, that human beings have uh, survived with some temperature scale. That temperature scale will be this scale in centigrade and Fahrenheit. And average temperature of the body is in centigrade 37 and Fahrenheit 98.6, right? But various uh, temperature change uh, of the increasing or decreasing will indicate the medical conditions. You may have fever, infections, or some other you know, problems of the body, right? So now, if you think about the temperature scale, I have it in here, temperature in uh, Kelvin scale in here, and you will see the range. So I have around 10 to the negative 10. Think about that is a very, very uh, low temperature. That is the lowest temperature found, found in the laboratory, MIT, uh, that temperature. Okay. Now, highest temperature we have it in here is 10 to the power 12, that is in heavy ions and things like that. So here, real, realistic heavy ions collide, right? So now when you think about this temperature scale, where are we in uh, Kelvins, you know that our usual temperature is 20, 
20 centigrade. Then if I convert into uh, Kelvin, I need to add 273.15. So that will give me around 293.15 in Kelvin. That means in this scale, we are in less than 300. That means we have 10 to the power 2 here, that is 100. We are in somewhere here. Right, so that is where we are in this scale. And in addition to that, you guys can see the uh, star's temperature ten to the power nine. Right, so uh, center of the Earth temperature around ten to the power in between four and five. Right, this will be the temperature scales that we can have it in our uh, real life. Okay, so now thermal equilibrium is very important concept that is belong to uh, zero law of thermodynamics. Uh, but the idea is if you have three objects or many objects in different temperature, if you keep them together, they're going to come with the equilibrium temperature. That means if I have A object in we'll say 100 degrees, B object in 50 degrees, C object in 70 degrees. When I combine these all objects together, you're going to come up with the new equilibrium temperature that will be the same for A, same for B, same for C. That is called it as thermal equilibrium. Okay, so now, as I mentioned in the beginning, when you uh, heat it up the object, that object going to expand. Mm -hmm. So now how much it will expand actually depend on uh, the material. That means it is depend on coefficients of linear expansion that is for the different materials, it is different, right? So now the expansion, this is my original length. If I change my temperature, I increase the temperature into T, then my material will be expand this amount. That is the delta L. Mm -hmm. That delta L will be able to calculate by using delta L will be equal to your original length, coefficient of linear expansion alpha and the change of temperature. That will give you the linear expansion. Right. So now if it is a volume and area, you have a different formula that will expand the area and that will expand the volume. So according to that, we need to use it. But in your class, at least when object heat it up, that will expand. How much it will linearly expand? If you know the original length, if you know the alpha, if you know the temperature difference, then you can find the change of the length. Okay. And so now heat. Heat is the energy in one way. We know that what is the energy is. Energy is basically uh, measured in joules and it is uh, ability to do the work. So that is the energy is, right? So now heat is a form of energy that is measured by using joules, right? So when the particles move uh, about more and take up more rooms, then we know that when heat it up, particle going to be uh, moving around and take the uh, more volume. So then we call it as the uh, uh, expand the uh, expand the volume of that object or the linear expansion if it is linear object, right? So now because of this reason, as a simple example, think about the ice. So you're going to heat it at the ice. Ice is a solid, right? Then you heat it up. Then you're going to get the water. Then you're going to heat it up. You're going to convert into vapor, right? This is the heating process that heat transfer solid, liquid, and gases states, right? So now heat measured by using joules, as I mentioned. But sometimes we use the calorie to measure the heat, right? Another unit. So one calorie will be equal to 4.18 joules. Right. So I have the definition, what is the one calorie means. So it is the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram object uh, or the water by one Celsius decrease. So that is, we call it as the calorie. Okay. So now um, uh, when you when you, when you think about the calorie, you will get confused with the food calorie. Food calorie and this calorie are not the equal. Right, they are different. So one food calorie will be equal to thousand of these heat calories. 
okay so there is a different way of saying the uh, food calories and uh, usually heat will transfer from where to where hot to cold when i have 70 centigrade object and when i have 30 centigrade object when i combine them together heat will be start from the hot object travel to into cold object then you're going to come into the equilibrium temperature that is not 70 that is not 30 but in between temperature that's the equilibrium temperature okay okay so now uh, first thing under the heat we're going to discuss is specific heat there are basically we're going to discuss two types of heat one is the specific heat other one is latent heat so this is where we're going to now discuss the specific heat. The specific heat is defined as the heat required to change the temperature of the material that will be proportional to the uh, your change of change of temperature of the material, mass of the material, and the uh, specific heat constant of the material. So the heat required to change of the temperature of the material is proportional to the mass and the temperature change of that object. So that is the uh, basically specific heat. So now I have some letters in here. Q we use for the heat, right? Q is the heat or energy. And M is the mass of the material in a SI unit that will be kilogram. And C is we call it as specific heat capacity that is material dependent property uh, that will be measured by joules per kelvin per kilogram okay and delta t is the change of temperature in kelvin so now we need to be very careful with the units because if you use the change of temperature in kelvin you need to use the specific heat uh, joule per kelvin kilogram so if you use the change of temperature in uh, centigrade you need to use the uh, units for c uh, joules per centigrade per kilogram so that uh, conversion you need to uh, think when you solve the uh, problems okay so now heat uh, will be conserved quantity as we know heat is the energy energy is the conserved then heat should be a conserved so when we define the conservation of heat we need to uh, use it as an isolated system we can have closed system open system open system means transfer heat everywhere and closed system means there is no going out or coming in uh, isolated system is the best system that we can discuss to use the uh, conservation of energy that means the closed system where there is no energy in and out right so that is the isolated system so we are working with isolated system in your class in that case i will be able to use heat lost equal heat gain that is the heat conservation okay and so now we're going to move into the laden heat. So laden heat is basically uh, define it as the hidden energy. Uh, that means it is the energy that can be transferred without change of temperature. Without change of temperature, heat change, we call it as the laden heat. Right. So best example you can think to think about the latent heat and specific heat together is the ice. Right. Let's say I have the axis heat in this side. This is I'm measuring heat and this side I have temperature in centigrade. So if I take the ice at 40 degrees, negative 40 degrees, everybody know it is ice. Right. And then if I heat it up until zero degrees, so this everywhere I have state ice, right? But there is a heat change because when I change the temperature uh, from negative 40 to zero, there is a heat change. So because of that, this will be belong to the specific heat. That means you can calculate the heat by using M specific heat and change of temperature that is related to specific heat because of the change of temperature but when you come to here to here 
So you see that what happened? This is in zero degrees. That means here I have ice, but here I have water. Now what happened? Ice change into water, but it is still zero degrees. No change of temperature, but my heat axis increased from 20 to 40. So now this is belong to the hidden energy. No heat, no temperature change, but there is heat change. Then this will be a latent heat that we're going to calculate by using mass of the ice times the latent heat of the ice, M times L. I will come to that L notation later. But same thing happened next. Now I have water in zero degrees, but I convert it into 100 degrees water. Now you see, because of the temperature change in this part, we should have a specific heat that will be M C times delta T. So I need to take the C correctly. Here it is for the water, C for the water. Here C for the ice. Okay. And when I come to the 100 degrees, then I keep the 100 degrees, but I change water state into vapor state. Water into vapor here. Right? So now this is belong to latent heat. So now mass latent heat of vaporization. Here latent heat of fusion. Okay. So now you can see your heat can be changed in two, two ways. One is changing of temperature will affect to the heat change. Other one is no change of temperature also will affect to the heat change, but your phase going to be changed from ice to water or water to uh, vapor. So now, uh, as I mentioned, solid to liquid or the solid to uh, water or the ice to water, we have the uh, latent heat of fusion, uh, latent heat of vaporization when you have liquid to vapor. So according to that, I need to use the correct formula. So again, Q is the energy, M is the mass, L is the latent heat of fusion or vapor accordingly. So now uh, heat transfer. So heat can be transferred by using uh, three methods. One is conduction, convection, second one, third one is radiation. Now conduction and convection usually happen when there is a media, but radiation we don't want even media to transfer the heat. Okay. So now this example you can think is when you go to the US store that you're going to cook it right when you cook you use the pot right mm -hmm. uh, so now your hand going to when you touch the handle you're going to feel the hot because of the conduction that will happen right mm -hmm. it conduct to the uh, hand through the pot right that is called it as conduction process and in addition to that after you watch heat in your water you're going to see the water particles moving top to bottom and then uh, bottom to top and top to bottom. They are moving like a circle because all the uh, cold uh, particles will move into the bottom to heat it up and heat particles go up because it, they're going to low dense, right? So that process, we call it as convection process, right? In addition to that, if you stay in close to uh, this cooking uh, place, then you feel hot without even touching the pot. Why you feel hot? Because of the radiation. So now we discuss about three things. Conduction can be going to move actually to your uh, next totally different concept uh, belong to uh, simple harmonic oscillations and waves. Okay. So now uh, in this section, uh, we are planning to discuss about uh, waves a little bit, simple harmonic oscillations, and a little bit about the sounds. So that will be the parts that we're going to cover. Okay, so now first thing is you need to understand some of the uh, terms. So one is the displacement. We'll say I have a spring that I'm going to compress. I don't have a spring in myself. If I'm going to compress the spring, then if I release it, what will happen to the spring is it will do back and forth motion, right? When I do this back and forth motion, 
there is something change in the object. So object velocity, when you compress, it will be zero. But when you let it go, it has the some velocity at max on the equilibrium position and then we'll go to the all the way to the further distance and then go back, right? So that means velocity will be zero and turn back to the other direction and go back and go back and forth, right? So because of that, your velocity zero is all the way this side, velocity zero is all the way this side, this side velocity increase max and velocity decrease uh, max and Zero, right? That's how it will uh, go in back and forth motion. So now velocity of the object uh, and the displacement of the object are some important things that we need to discuss in here. Okay. So now displacement is called it as the measured from the equilibrium point. That means if I have an equilibrium point, that means basically resting point on of the your strip. Okay. This is your equilibrium position right that x equals zero so now when i compress it i move some distance x uh, distance x distance then your displacement will be x right so that is call it as the displacement so now amplitude is the maximum displacement that means when it go to the maximum place that display left or right right there is a maximum place that can display that maximum place that will display we call it as the amplitude in that case in my example in here this is a value this is basically x value x equal to a at the amplitude case and the cycle as we discussed many times now cycle is the basically uh, pull uh, to pro motion if you complete one cycle, if you start from here, go here, come back here, go here, come back here, that is one cycle, right? And period, we'll call it as the time to complete one cycle. And frequency is one over period, as we discussed. It is the number of cycles per unit time, unit second, okay? So that's, those are the terms that you need to understand the uh, going forward. Okay, so now we're going to attach the spring uh, vertically. When you attach the spring vertically, when you add the weight, what will happen to this? So now if I try to uh, put the object, we'll say I'm going to try with 100 grams in here. So now what happened is spring going to move up and down, up and down, right? By keeping your equilibrium position at rest right so now because of moving up and down definitely there is a potential energy change because of the velocity uh, going to the rest on the bottom rest on the top at the middle you have a maximum velocity because of the velocity there is a uh, kinetic energy right so now potential and kinetic energy will also come to the play when there is an object and the spring going up and down right so now this object can go up and down according to the mass that you apply and also if you apply the different mass the higher mass you know it will be stretched more because of the Hooke's law that we discussed earlier okay so that's just for you to see and so as I mentioned, there is a kinetic energy and potential energy because of the position and the velocity, right? So that's what I have it in here, how the velocity change, how the acceleration change, how the displacement change, okay? So displacement at this place is zero, velocity is max in this place, and acceleration is almost zero. But here we have velocity zero, velocity zero, velocity zero, up and down, okay? But acceleration up and down. Right. According to that, you can think about the potential energy. So they can say potential energy zero in here, but potential energy max in here, potential energy mean in here, right? And kinetic energy max in here, right? And uh, zero in here, and kinetic energy zero in here, right? So now, uh, I have to discuss a um, very simple formula after we learn about the Hooke's law uh, earlier also, uh, the oscillation of this spring uh, period, that means time to complete one cycle, will be different on 
two parameters. What these two parameters are, mass that you're going to add and the spin constant that you have it on the spin. So then root of mass over spin constant will give you the uh, period. That means mass increase will increase the period, increase in K, decrease the period, right? So now according to uh, that connection, analog to that, we can have a simple pendulum. Simple pendulum is the pendulum that you can have object attached to the wire. So I have object attached to the wire. Right. So when I make the oscillation, this will do the back and forth oscillation. So that will call it as the simple pendulum. Now, simple pendulum is the physics behind the clock. Right. So now if I can measure the time to make one complete cycle, that will be the period. So now in that case, simple pendulum, period is depend on the L and G. L is the length of the your pendulum length of the pendulum that means if i'm going to use the length of the pendulum this length this length is the l right and then g everybody know but it is independent of the mass that i'm going to oscillate in simple pendulum in simple pendulum it is depend on the length and the gravity only okay but root is there Okay, this is actually the energy that I was discussing earlier, but I'm going to probably jump into next one since we discuss it. Mm -hmm. So now uh, wave description, right? So uh, wave, uh, as we discussed, we have discussed period and we discuss about the frequency uh, and we should know how to calculate these two things. If you know one thing, you can calculate the other one, right? But Simple example, you need to think what is given. Simple example will say pendulum takes two vibration in one second. So now what is given? Two vibration per second. So that will be given frequency. Frequency is two because it is two vibration per one second. Frequency is the revolution per second or vibration per second, right? That is two because of that frequency is two and measured by using hertz. We know that hertz, hertz is equal to one over second units. Okay, these units are the same. And then if you know to calculate the period, you need to take one over frequency that will be one over two in units of second. That's the relation between period and frequency. Okay. So now uh, when there is a wave motion, this frequency and velocity and wavelength are three parameters that we need to know. So one is the wavelength, other one is the frequency, and uh, they will be related each other with the formula that we call it as wave equation. So velocity is V equal Lambda, lambda is the symbol that we use for the wavelength and f is the frequency. Now we know what is the frequency is. Let's take a look on what is the wavelength is. Wavelength is, so your wave can be drawn as a sinusoidal shape, right? So now if I take the distance from peak to peak, we call it as the crest point, crest. So if you take the distance from crest to crest by using length uh, information, that will give you the wavelength. But this will be in time axis, this will be period, right? Because one cycle, one cycle means you will start and come back to the same point, one cycle. That is one cycle, right? That is the wavelength. So now peak to peak distance is the crest to crest distance is the wavelength and also, you can say here to here also wavelength because these distance are the same, right? Here to here also have the distance uh, wave. Okay, that's also wavelength. Same because one cycle length we call it as the wavelength, and amplitude will be basically height of this wave as we discussed. Okay. So now any wave should have these three characteristics: so wavelength, frequency, and velocity they are related to each other. So now uh, waves will be usually uh, can be divided into two categories, transverse and longitudinal waves. 
So transverse waves are the waves that can, you see that in here, uh, you can travel it as a up and down motion. You will see that your wave is traveling in this direction, that the velocity direction, but this individual particles, you see that they're going up in this case, going down in this case, they are moving perpendicular to the direction of the velocity. When there is particle moving perpendicular to the direction of motion, those waves we call it as transverse waves, right? Mm -hmm. But there is a other category, longitudinal waves. In longitudinal waves is basically uh, a spring that you can compress and stretch. So when you have a particle on the spring, they are doing back and forth motion. That means they are parallel to the direction of the velocity or anti-parallel to the direction of the velocity. Those we call it as the longitudinal waves. So now let's think about the example. Light that you will see from your eye will be a transverse wave. Light waves are transverse waves. Okay, but sound waves will be longitudinal waves. That means when I speak from my mouth, I produce the sound. The sound mm -hmm. will travel from here to my computer by moving air molecules back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. Then from my computer to your computer, you get it from electromagnetic waves, that is transverse waves. And then your computer to your uh, ears, you're going to hear by again using molecules uh, back and forth motion, that is the sound waves. That's the mm -hmm. difference between these two waves, okay? And any kind of waves will do the interference. So that's how we hear the sound, right? Now you can hear the uh, cello sound outside. So that's my son is playing the cello when I do the recording. So you're going to hear the uh, kind of interference uh, because of combining of uh, two waves, right? So now uh, this com combining of intensity of the waves we have to use the superposition principle. Superposition principle means combination of interference of the waves. Mm -hmm. So now they can interfere with constructive interference or they can interfere with destructive interference. So constructive interference means if you have a wave that will travel like this, one wave, right? And if I have another wave that will, uh, I definitely forget to put into full screen, let me put that. Screen. And another wave that I have, we'll say I have another wave exactly. Uh, I'm going to go with, let me draw this line first. That's the direction of the waves. And my next wave will say, going like this. Right, so two amplitude waves, but they are in same frequency. So now when you hear the wave, what you're going to hear? You're going to hear the combination of these waves. That is, we call it as the constructive interference. Because of this height and this height, you're going to hear a wave like this. That is the constructive waves. This is the constructive one, combination of both waves. That is called it as constructive interference, right? So destructive interference can be happen uh, when you hear the two sounds, but in opposite direction. We say, I'm going, I'm sorry that drawing is bad because my hand is all the way bottom of the screen. So this is my direction of the wave travel. And if I have a wave, uh, first wave in this way, right? So if my second wave is, moving this way, see the difference? So now this wave have the height here, this wave have a negative height. Because of that, this will create a destructive interference. That means the wave that you're going to hear will be lower than your higher one because you need to subtract the amount that you have it in opposite direction, okay? You have to subtract the amount that you have it in your opposite direction. Then you're going to hear the purple color sound that is construct destructive interference. So you can have destructive, complete destructive interference. If your up and down waves are equal in amplitude, then you don't hear anything, 
okay that is the uh, interference okay so now we're going to move into the standing waves the standing waves is the wave pattern that uh, when you have two waves exactly same frequency but they are moving in opposite direction then we call it as the standing waves so simple example you can think by using the string that you're going to make the uh, the code that you're going to make the oscillation or string that you're going to use the oscillation so now there are a couple of things that we need to understand here these points we call it as the node that will basically create a both waves uh, totally destructive at that point and here is the uh, another node right but here you have anti-node that is where that both waves are totally in opposite side okay so now node and anti-node this whole thing this is we call it as a loop okay so now when you make a uh, waves on the string you're going to see this pattern you're going to see one loop you're going to see two loops you're going to see three loops four loops five loops right so what you are doing in there you basically increase in number of loops that means you are basically a change in the frequency when you uh, change in the frequency you have change in the number of loops so vibrator can do this on the laboratory right so now only thing you need to understand in here in even next one is basically understanding how many wavelengths we have then we velocity equal frequency times wavelength we will be able to calculate the frequency if you if they travel with same velocity right so in this case definitely this length because you see that it is a one single cycle because of that your length that you have in here will be exactly same as the wavelength but here you definitely see this length i have here is half of the wavelength because it is the half of your second one one loop only because of that it is half of the wavelength now here i have three loops it is greater than the wavelength that means i have two-third of the uh, wavelength okay so now uh, now let's move into a little bit about the resonance that how you're going to hear the things because of uh, the how you're going to see the things because of this standing waves right this will be the simulation uh, results that we can uh, uh, show it uh, by using the photographs and uh, how the frequency change as i mentioned earlier this is equal to the wavelength this is half the wavelength this is two-third of the wavelength and then we know that the frequency equal uh, you can write it as the wavelength or sorry frequency equal velocity over wavelength right so now according to that you can see here if i have a frequency here my frequency will be velocity is the same but wavelength is twice of n and this case my frequency equal wavelength over n and this case my frequency is equal wavelength over 2l but 3 because of two third right so now according to that this is frequency 1 frequency 2 and frequency 3 you observe a pattern in here right so now according to the pattern second one is two times of first one third one is three times of first one because of that this one we call it as fundamental or first harmonic this is second harmonic because it's two times this is third harmonic okay those are the uh, ways that you can categorize this uh, resonance okay I think we can move into the sound a little bit for last uh, five minutes and uh, sound uh, can travel in any matter except the vacuum vacuum there is no sound waves can travel okay and but sound has different uh, speed in different material and sound has different speed in different temperature let's think about the temperature first so you will hear more sound speed of sound on higher temperature than the 
lower temperature. That means the hot day when you go outside, when you go through the uh, bridge on the hot day, and if you go through the bridge on the cold day, in hot day, you're going to hear more echo sound because of the uh, sound waves travel faster in the hot day, right? Uh, but sound speed at normal temperature will be around we can take it as around 340 uh, volt normal air. Okay. But in addition to that, the speed of the sound is changing with the material. You see that here I have the water, water and air compare what happened to the speed of the sound. When you, uh, when you have water, that means uh, your air state into water state speed of sound is increasing. When you go to the glass, it is a solid state, you're going to see a more uh, speed of sound. That's how the speed of sound is changing with the materials. Okay. So now to get an uh, knowledge, general knowledge about the speed of the sound and the light, because we are talking about two uh, waves, speed and the, uh, the sound and the light, and light has the speed uh, 3 times 10 to the power 8, sound has the speed 340 meters per second. So it is millions times greater than the speed of the sound uh, of the speed of the light. The speed of the light is millions times greater than the speed of the sound. Okay. Okay, so now since we are hearing the sound, we need to understand a little bit about what is the intensity related to sound, what is the frequency related to the sound that we discussed. So loudness of the sound is basically uh, related to the amplitude that we are talking on the uh, equation. So amplitude related to the loudness or intensity uh, uh, related to the loudness, right? Mm -hmm. Now pitch sound, is related to the frequency of the sound. So that is the uh, x-axis of your wave frequency or the time axis. And loudness is amplitude axis or intensity, right? And audible range is the range that human can hear. This is the uh, frequency range that we can hear. And ultrasound is above the 20,000 hertz. There are some animals that can hear better than as us, like bats can hear 100,000 and dogs can hear 50,000 hertz. Okay. Uh, infrasound is the lower than the 20, usually earthquakes and thunderstorms, we have uh, low uh, frequency waves. Normally speaking, sound will be around 300 to uh, 3,000 hertz. Okay. This is in frequency. Okay, so now how you relate the intensity, how we uh, measure that when you, when you check our uh, uh, ears uh, of the sound, we are measuring it by using decibel. Decibel is the unit of intensity that we're going to measure, right? So now intensity is related to uh, basically uh, uh, the measured by using watts over meter squared. Unit of intensity is watts over meter squared. So human uh, ears can detect sound with the intensity as low as 10 to the negative 12. That is, we call it as threshold of hearing. Threshold of hearing, we use the letter I naught. That is around 10 to the negative 12, right? So now if you need to calculate the uh, decibel unit, this is the formula that we need to use to calculate into the decibel of the your units, that is uh, intensity is watts per meter squared, and then decibel units will be calculated by using this formula. So I naught is this value, and it is a logarithmic function that you need to consider to convert into uh, decibel. Okay, decibel is the sound level that we are measuring. Okay. And intensity is something that we can uh, calculate when you have the source that produces the sound. Simple example is the, uh, you can think about the fire truck. Fire truck will produce the sound. When you need to measure the intensity, intensity will be able to measure by using uh, the power that fire truck produces. That is the P power uh, symbol measured by watts. And then I have the 4 phi R squared. That will be the basically the 
uh, area that will have uh, covered with the point that you interest, right? Simple example, if your fire truck is here, if you are watching in here in the R distance, then if you take the this whole area, that whole uh, sphere, that area is 4 pi r squared. Uh, important thing is i is proportional to the r to the 1 over r power 2, basically. Okay, With the distance, inten intensity going to be decreased. So that's the important thing. Okay. I hope you guys get an, some kind of understanding in there. So now uh, these sounds, uh, vibrating of air columns or vibrating of strings always happen in if, when, if, when you play the instruments, right? So guitar uh, or cello or violin, you have strings that have different thickness. You change the, your finger position by changing the harmonic. Even piano, you know that you have octave mode that have the different length of these strings and different thickness that can you can vibrate them uh, to produce the uh, harmonic that we uh, need. Okay, and even air instruments will be the basically same that you produce the uh, create the harmonic by changing the uh, closing holes and those things. Right. Okay, so now when it vibrate, I just want you to understand some important concept in here, how frequency will change, right? So simple example we have it in here is the two open side tube. So this one is open, this side also open, right? That is my first example on the left. So now when I produce the sound in left side, that sound will go to the right side of the tube. Now there are possibilities that can create the sound waves only belong to the category that I have it in here because this one is open. That means you have open mouth on the ending and this side also open mouth. That means it can create only node in the middle to make a harmony. That's the only way that travel, the wave can travel. This is, we call it as the first harmonic that you're going to hear, right? So now definitely we know it is uh, half of the uh, wavelength uh, on the uh, your figure, uh, but the next time when you create more frequency, what will happen is you're going to see two nodes, right? When you see two nodes, now you're going to see that it is actually a wavelength, right? It is a one wavelength. So now here I have three nodes. Now this will be two third of the wavelength. Right, so now three, three over two of the wavelength. So now, by watching this pattern that I we discussed earlier, also we can see the frequencies that I have. The frequency f one here, it is twice here. It is three times the frequency. Right, what that means is the open tube frequency uh, will be this one that will be increasing when you make uh, more. Uh, loops inside by increasing the frequency, right? Those are the harmonics. But I need to, I want you to understand the difference between next one and this one. So now next one, we have close end in here. So when you close the end, what will happen, your wave will hit this end that will create the knot and this side is open. So now this one is how much? It is not the wavelength. It is not the half of the wavelength even, but it is a quarter of the wavelength. It is one fourth of the wavelength. Why it is that? You need to think. So your wavelength is this one. So now you see that here is the close end. That means you are definitely working with this, this small part only here. Right? This part that I'm drawing is here. That is one fourth of the wavelength. Right? So now if I keep increasing the frequency, I cannot exist in the two times if I will move into the third harmonic in this case because I cannot have anything else in between. Only thing I can have another node in here. Now, this is uh, three fourth of the uh, wavelength. Because of that, it is three times. We call it as the third harmonic, right? And then next one is the fourth harmonic, the fifth harmonic, actually, odd number of harmonic is there. 
right? So now I want you to check the left side and right side. When you have open tube, exactly same length, both sides open. Now you're going to close the one end. Now by watching the frequency in here and frequency in here, what can you say? So when you have same length, both opening end, one close end, then you're going to decrease the frequency when you close one end because here be over two, where here be over four. Frequency will be decreased, right? And then think about if you change the length, what will happen, okay? Okay, so now interference waves will create the beats also. Beats means basically if you consider very close to frequency waves, if you send them together, you're going to observe exactly same feature after some time that we call it as the beat uh, period, right? So now beat frequency will be able to calculate by using change of these two frequencies. That is, we call it as the uh, beat frequencies. One last thing I need to discuss is the Doppler effect. So Doppler effect is happening when there is a frequency change that can happen in light, also that can happen in sound. So here I'm going to talk about the Doppler effect in sound. Okay, so when you have a fire truck, if there is two people sitting exactly in the same distance, left and right, they're going to hear the same frequency, right? But we'll say fire truck is moving to the right side person, then left person will hear the low frequency, uh, right person going to hear the higher frequency. That frequency shift that we call it as the Doppler effect. So Doppler effect can happen because of the source is moving or because of the observer is moving. When the observer is moving towards the source, frequency is higher. When the source is moving towards the observer, frequency higher. The other way, frequency is lower. That we call it as the Doppler effect. Frequency shift. That here because of relative motion of the object and the source. So that is called it as the Doppler effect. Okay, so I will stop here and that is end of your unit uh, three.